Thank you very much for coming to the third annual Humanitas Lecture in Economic Thought to be given by Professor Roger Meyerson. I am Vince Crawford. I'm a professor of economics here at Oxford, and I'm the academic director for this part of the program for All Souls College. Um, the Humanitas program is a series of visiting professorships in Oxford and Cambridge, whose goal is to bring leading scholars and practitioners to both universities to address major themes in the arts, social sciences, and humanities. Created by Lord Weidenfeld, the program is managed and funded by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Um, Oxford's economic thought professorships are funded by the generous support of Dr. Donald Marin and run in collaboration with the Division of Humanities and with All Souls College. Um, I, I especially want to thank Natalia Bulgakova of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, who's here tonight, Sarah Bebb and Claire Oxenberry Palmer of the Humanities Division, who are here tonight, and the Manspool and staff of All Souls for all of their help in organizing both this lecture and tomorrow's symposium at All Souls College. So in general, for the program, we, we seek distinguished speakers whose work illustrates both the depth of economic theory and its usefulness in thinking about policies to further human well-being. We're particularly, we also, we also sought speakers who can, who can explain um, the ideas to a general audience. And as you may imagine, if you know any economists, those are stringent criteria indeed. Uh, so we're especially pleased to have found a third economist to more than meets both criteria, namely Professor Meyerson of the University of Chicago. Um, Professor Meyerson received the AB summa cum laude and the SM in applied math and the PhD in applied math from Harvard University. Um, at that time, the applied math program at Harvard University was a reliable source of first-rate economists as well as other kinds of, of people. Um, from two, 1976 to 2001, he was professor of economics at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, and then he became professor and Glenn, Glenn A. Lloyd Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, where he remains today. Um, he is an economic theorist of great analytical power, great originality, and great depth. And he had the good fortune to live through, so far, two scientific revolutions in economic theory. The first is the game theory revolution that first enabled us to rigorously analyze situations other than perfect competition, individual de decision making, and monopoly, um, and which was the main source of incitement, excitement in microeconomic theory in most of the 70s and 80s. The second revolution was what's now called the economic design or market design revolution, which grew out of the first. Um, and the way it grew out of the first was by the realization that game theoretic methods allowed you not just to take economic institu institutions as given, but rather to analyze them as variables to be optimized. Um, and it's not fair to say that Professor Meyerson was fortunate to live through that revolution because he was one of the instigators of that revolution. Uh, in fact, in three incredible papers in the early 80s, one on regulating monopolists with unknown costs, uh, one on optimal auction, auction design in the sense of revenue maximizing auction design, and one on efficient bargaining rules, he set the stage for a lot of further developments in economic design. And it's those three contributions for which he was honored by, the, by sharing the 2007 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. And it's also that work that lay the foundations for the more recent work in political economy, where he's trying to apply the same general principles of behavior, the game theoretic analyses, of behavior um, that he used to solve precisely uh, important specific problems 
to address the much harder problems of designing um, constitutions and state building. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor Roger Meyerson to Oxford. I'm very, very grateful, Vince, for, for the kind words and for the invitation, for the privilege of being here to speak on. Um, I uh, am the, the, the honor of being a guest at, at, at all, Oxford University at All Souls College is, is, is something I'm, I'm very aware of and very grateful for. Uh, I, I'm going to take a I am, as you say, a theorist. I'm very much a, a fundamental mathematical theorist, and I'm going to talk about a, uh, a very applied problem a, 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 that, because I think it raises important questions and, that per, and because I hope, obviously, that a theorist can say something. I'll even try to offer an answer to some of these questions, but, uh, but I know I'm in no position to have uh, a final answer, but, but, but only to, to offer a tentative one in, in discussion. Uh, I, uh, I should say that uh, when I think about the, the heritage of all souls, uh, the, the, I want to, among many distinguished names associated with this college, I, I, I want to mention T.E. Lawrence as someone who, whose uh, spirit uh, uh, I, I hope will inspire the discussion. There are, I'm honored to have people in the audience who have uh, credentials to give some uh, uh, version of his of the perspective he would have brought uh, but it's a it, it, the practical questions of well, what, how does it say the on the path from development to anarchy uh, uh, on the development path from anarchy to prosperity what comes first that basic question uh, faces practical policy makers in a state building emergency in a, in in in, in uh, for people who have who are have taken charge of a failed state. And I want to ask the question, the, the title is, is Standards for State Building. Uh, the fundamental question of how to build a state is one of the fundamental questions of social science, and that's why I can't walk away from it. And it is an immediate practical concern to interveners in a state building emergency. I use the word standards, but I think an alternative could have been charter. I, I take from Paul Collier, the su suggestion that those who would like to talk about helping people who would like to help poorer countries in the world should talk about standards for international policy and behavior, uh, and that a place like this in Oxford is a good place to start a conversation uh, about setting appropriate standards. And in, in that sense, I'd like to take Paul Collier's challenge and suggest that there's a need for a charter for custodians of democratic state building. Uh, let me say I emphatically want to enter this discussion, maybe I said because it's a good question, because it's an important question, and because talking about important fundamental questions is a good way to learn things. I do not want to, to, to suggest that I am endorsing invasions to bring democracy. Uh, I think I've tried to say in italics uh, what I think should be a fundamental mantra that, that we should assume that any military operation is going, is going to bring harm to people in the population, and it might, with hope, also bring some good. Uh, let me try to phrase the question that I want to think of right. Uh, I think it's helpful for us to say, I, I speak, I'm an American citizen, I'm speaking in, in Britain. Uh, we have had a partnership in, in invading some countries, allegedly, to hopefully, uh, with the professed intention of bringing good to those countries. But I think for this discussion, I, will tr I, should, tr I should try, I may fail, to phrase the question this way. Let's speak as countrymen, our country, and imagine if our country were to be invaded by some external force that's going to take control of our country, but they profess that they are coming in, in in force into our country with the goal of returning us to sovereignty and as a healthy, de independent, democratic nation, uh, what standards would we like them to be held to? Let's put it that way. And uh, just as we hope brain surgeons can talk about brain surgery without being over eager to find people to try it out on, uh, let, that's the sense in which I want to raise this discussion. If we're, any hope 
to, of, of, of ha such interventions happening successfully requires discussion and any hope for those who think it's not possible at least of holding interveners accountable for their uh, good benev professed benevolence requires us to set some standards. Uh, and the question, of course, is can uh, plenty of people have invaded, throughout history, uh, countries have been invaded uh, by conquerors who professed uh, uh, good intentions. Uh, can democrat democratic state building, if, it, if, it, if it's possible, needs to, be, needs to distinguish itself from imperialist domination. I will argue that elections are not enough, that something more, that merely holding elections is not enough. Let me, uh, let me say I want to talk in the context, and tomorrow, uh, uh, at tomorrow's symposium that I, that, uh, that I hope is publicized on flyers here um, will be more focused on, on questions of development. I think development economics is related to state, to, to state building, uh, that the relationship is, is uncomfortable and I understand that, but the truth is uh, providing public goods is something leaders do to, to build support and so development assistance that comes in and tries to provide local public goods to help people is not ever cleanly separable from political assistance, but more deeply when the root causes of de underdevelopment are political, a program for economic development cannot succeed without inducing some political change. Um, so the questions are clearly related, even if uh, the, the, the practitioners uh, operate under different rules. Uh, I certainly want to say at the beginning, I, I take it as an open question as to whether democratic state building is even possible. Um, what I do know is that th what we should all recognize is that throughout history, conquerors have established s stable political systems. When they've, armies have conquered territory and established stable political regimes there, not typically non-democratic and, 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 and colonial, but, or, 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 but uh, uh, and non-democratic states have become democratic. Political transition is possible. So, there is a deep question, and I think I'll try to say later something about the answer, perhaps, of why should not should democratic state building be so difficult when military conquest is to establish non-democratic political supremacy has has been done throughout history? Uh, is there something intrinsically harder about non about democratic state building? Uh, and I would compare the, the rather brief history of, of, of American suppression of, a, of an insert of, of establishing a, reg, a colonial regime in the Philippines in 1900 compared to the, the great difficulty that, that American and other and, and, and British and other ISAF forces have had trying to establish a, 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 a sovereign democratic regime in Afghanistan since 2002. Okay, so let's get to work. Uh, I'm a theorist, a general theorist, so I obviously have a vested interest in the proposition that there are some general principles to talk about. Let me acknowledge that in, it is extremely common and I to find in, in discussions of, of, of state building, counterinsurgency, and, 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 and such literatures, that there is no cookie cutter, one size fits all approach to political development, that, um, that people who, who are involved uh, intervening in, uh, in, in a foreign country, I should say, that, should have asserted that, that, that I take it for granted that at some point in the future, in, in, in at least some of our lifetimes, some major country will, for whatever reasons, for better or for worse, take charge militarily of another country and these questions will become practical. Obviously, there is, it, politics in every, in every society is different in many ways. The, the style of, the, the way people identify their leaders differs, uh, the way people build trust with each other in different cultures is fundamentally different. But I would argue that there, there are general principles of politics and general principles of, 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 of the, the problem of politics and the problem of building trust in, in different societies has common elements. But the no cookie cutter, one size fits all the, well, the, the argument that every, I'm sorry, the argument that every system, every country is different means that an intervention must begin with consulting local experts. The local experts who will be consulted when, they, when these foreigners invade our country, well, who can they trust? If they grab me on the street, they don't know whose side I'm on. The people they can trust the most and who have, are going to be prominent social uh, leaders who are collaborating with them, who, who have welcomed them into our country. 
the, the local political experts who are most, lo, no local political experts are neutral on the questions of politics of their country. And I will specifically argue that the most prominent indigenous supporters of any intervention will be people who may expect that they or their, their allies will, become, will gain positions of high power in the, in the new regime. And they therefore may have a systematic bias towards advocating more centralization of power. And I believe that that bias has led to excessively centralized regimes being installed after, uh, after such interventions in recent history. That's my central to my, that, that's the core of my thesis. No, no the, to get right away to, the, to, to where, where I hope to go, I'm gonna try to suggest the principles. There's a chart, the question of a charter is a good one. I wanna provoke discussion and I'll, by offering an answer. And my answer, in brief, summarized here, that uh, uh, in, in, in less than 100 words, I hope, with the broadest possible multinational support, I'm going to argue, occupying powers should try to foster a political re reconstruction that's based on two pillars, a multi-party national assembly and, and elected local councils. Each of these needs to be funded with a transparent budget. And when I say transparent, I mean accounting to the local population. In fact, it would be not a bad idea to, the, for, the, for the occupying powers to keep track of all the money they've spent since the moment they entered the country and say, dear population, here's how much we've spent on you so far. Everything is accountable to the, the occupied people because I believe democratic development de depends on a plentiful supply of leaders who have good reputations for using public funds responsibly in both national and local politics. So there's my core principle and I want to, where I hope to go in, in the 45 minutes. So first I have to say, what, why, are, 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 why do we need standards? Isn't it obvious? And, and it's been assumed often that it's obvious. We're, they're going to invade our country, but don't worry, they'll hold elections within a couple of years. Uh, why are elections not enough to ve verify that leaders have been ind indigenously selected? Look. Interim control by foreign forces can be used to install an interim leader. It's going, there, going, there's, there, was, there was, either this is an, an invasion because the, there, there's been, the, the state has broken down into chaos, it's, it's, it's an invasion to bring, to bring new political stability to a failed state, or we've overthrown some previous regimes, a, a Saddam Hussein dictatorship and the, and, and the, old, the old regime has been, has been chased out of power. So now there's a vacuum, there's a power vacuum at the top. So somebody has to, the, 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 the interveners need to put somebody in at the top, uh, and that, per, that interim leader is going to have the first opportunity to develop a national patronage network, the first opportunity since the collapse of the old regime. Now, a, a commission is going to draft a constitution. Uh, I, I should say, uh, I, one of the things I've criticized Paul Bremer for is that he argued his from basic a theory principle that he brought to his 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 his, his work as 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 the uh, as the uh, head of the the the, the, uh, the the viceroy in charge of Iraq under coalition forces uh, was that there could be no elections in Iraq until first there was a constitution drawn up. But of course, the committee to draw up the constitution would be hand picked or was picked was was selected under the influence of of the invaders. Uh, and their agents like Paul Bremer. Uh, but eventually you can put a constitution to, to the population, ask them to ratify it. It's been drafted under the interim leader. Uh, typically in such uh, uh, quest plebiscites, uh, there's no specified alternative but the implicit threat of chaos if we don't ratify this constitution. The constitution can be written to concentrate power in an office which the interim leader expects to be the strongest candidate. We could call that generally the presidency. Uh, I'm speaking in Britain, we have a parliamentary system, but you, and, and so we, I know, so perhaps you don't have intimate familiarity with what madness presidential elections can be. But a presidential election, in particular, demands that voters coordinate on a few candidates. And the interim leader is naturally going to be one focal contender against diffuse opposition that lacks access to patronage and controlling the electoral process. The interim leader can be acclaimed, uh, can, can, with high probability will be acclaimed an elected president, but the fact is, of course, that his position will really be owed to the foreigners who picked him in the first place. Leadership 
tends to be self-perpetuating, and in that way, the foreigner's intervention can have long-lasting effects unless people generally re reject the intervention's legitimacy. Let me say, in any society that has an autonomous existence, we should recognize, well, we should recognize that a society's norms for identifying its authoritative leaders are its core cultural asset. If a society has maintained its autonomous existence, uh, it's because they have internal methods of under, uh, ways of understanding, of identifying their own leadership that is not controlled by foreigners. In theory, successful standards, uh, my last slide here says, successful standards for democratic state building should make it less unacceptable. Obviously, any society must have, that exists must have deep-seated norms of rejecting uh, foreign in, in interference in the selection of their own leaders. But if we could figure out what democratic state building was to consist of, then perhaps we would be less hostile to those foreigners coming in to, uh, to politically reconstruct our country. Uh, I should say something as a theorist, to say about, I've got four points here that I want to address about where do I come from in economic theory, because I certainly cannot claim uh, I've done some, some good work that I'm proud of in which I've proven some mathematical theorems. I have no mathematical theorems, and so, so I'm speaking uh, beyond, beyond my expertise, but I, I come from some expertise that, that I'm applying, and I want to tell you something about what I'm thinking about. One very important idea, Thomas Schelling's focal point effect, tells us how rational behavior can be influenced by publicly recognized boundaries and cultural perceptions of legitimate authority. What Thomas Schelling talked about was games that had multiple equilibria. And these, each Nash equilibrium of a game is a description of how people are going to behave such that if everyone believed that, that description, then everyone would in fact find it in their best interest to do as it, to, 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 to behave in this way. But many situations have multiple equilibria, and then the need to coordinate makes the public perception of one equilibrium a compelling social force. I should say this idea is, is, has been articulated in, in, in our lifetimes by, by Tom Schelling, but David Hume said something of the same, that, that, that public perception has a compelling force in morals where it doesn't necessarily have in, for example, physical science. Uh, and so the status of being a recognized leader can in fact become a self-confirming social fact. If I was understood to be the leader of my country, then you'd be a fool to think otherwise. I'm in fact not, and that's because nobody, nobody thinks I am. Um, agency theory in, in, in economics analysis teaches the importance of incentives in organizations. But then there's a question that I want to raise when we think about state building and politics of who guarantees that promised incentive rewards will be paid. In economic theory, there's a, a classic paper by Alkin and Demsetz from 1972 that argues that ultimately people are looking up the, in any organization, they were talking about the firm. Uh, I want to talk about not just firms, but, but, but political organizations. But the, to take their, their statement about the firm, the top leaders with an ownership stake in an organization ultimately have the responsibility for, get, for guaranteeing that, that responsible individuals will be monitored appropriately and will be rewarded for good performance. So they look to top leaderships with an ownership stake in an organization as being the ultimate guarantors of, uh, of, of, of the incentives in that organization. The owner of the firm uh, makes sure that everybody wants to work hard for his or her firm. Agents and non-political organizations, like a firm, may look to the, also look to the courts of the state for guarantees of these promised rewards. But in political organizations that exist to take part, power in the state itself, there's no such option. Political leaders, I want to argue, are the ultimate guarantors of incentive systems in their society. Powerful agents must trust them in the allocation of what we call moral hazard rents, to use a term from agency theory. Well, Reputation, the third thing I want to talk about is reputational equilibrium and repeated games. Long-term relationships uh, are modeled in, in economics and game theory by repeated games, and, and, and the folk theorem, the, the famous folk theorem of game theory says that there are going to be lots of equilibrium, and so there will be a multiple equilibrium problem. 
But these multiple equilibria are models of different relationships. And the point is, from repeated game theory, is that individuals can be strongly motivated by the long-term benefits of maintaining a good relationship with others. I want to argue that we should, the foundations of po political theory may begin with understanding that the key to successful leadership is a reputation for reliably rewarding good service. So that's combining the agency theory perspective with the repeated game perspective. The, that our societies, I'm going to argue, are states, when you talk about state building, states are founded by leaders. Leaders are, we're talking about political leaders. Political leaders need followers. They need to establish political factions to bring them to power and to build the state. And the first asset that every political leader needs is a reputation for reliably reward, reliably distributing patronage in any society, though we don't, may not want to talk about it. A reputation for reliably recognizing good service and rewarding it in the long run. The fourth thing I want to mention in, in economic theory that's not game theory, it's a, the other part, price theory, uh, classical pre-game theoretic economics, is the, the sense of, when we ask what, when there are only a few competitors in a market, what determines the level of profits? And one of the suggestions that's become a dominant idea in, in, in the, the, the economic analysis of oligopolistic markets, of markets with a few competing firms, is that the level of profits may depend not on the exact number of firms, two, three, or four, but on how easy it is for new competitors to enter, because any small number of firms can learn to collude with each other. I want to argue that democracy is, of course, meant to be about competition, not among firms, but among political parties, among political leaders. But the effect, I want to argue that the, that the effectiveness of democratic competition also depends on reducing entry barriers into politics, which means enabling new leaders to build reputations for spending public funds well in the public interest. So let's begin to build a theory of state building. As I tried to say, let me say it, I said it before and I want to say it again because this is the core of where I begin it, my theoretical understanding. In any political system, where we talk about state building, we're talking about establishing the state, and the state is, is built anew in every generation by people who take power in, in, in Britain and America, by the, they, they build a political machine that, that gets them elected, then they, they have to build a, 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 a cabinet uh, that, that's, going to, uh, that's going to govern the country. Uh, but, and these political factions and parties have leaders. Any state is built by leaders, and any leader, any political leader, needs fundamentally a reputation for reliably rewarding good service and gratitude. I should say, by the way, uh, that I think about Xenophon's education of Cyrus from antiquity as making exactly this point. Because that reputation is what the political leader needs to mobilize a network of active supporters. So the primary imperative, I've argued in a paper in the American Political Science Review a few years ago, the primary imperative for any political leader is to maintain his or her active supporters' trust. The, in the counterinsurgency literature, there's a, a, a focus, an appropriate focus, on the problems of building professional security forces uh, and other professional government agencies, professionalism in government agencies. These are, of course, bureaucracies and security forces are pillars of the state. But I want to argue that we should recognize that professional incentives in, 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 in the officer corps and in, 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 in the bureaucracy and in our, in, our, in our ministries ultimately depend on the recognition that the political leaders of the country will will sustain these, these promised, this promised system of rewards. Our civil service acts uh, have uh, taken some of the politics out of the, the, the reward system, but, but it would be truly revolutionary in, in America or Britain to run for office based on, I will repeal the Civil Service Act and just appoint my supporters. I'm going to fire all officers above the rank of sergeant in the military and dismiss all civil servants and put my own people in charge. Even if I were running on a purely peaceful basis, that would in effect be, be, be a, re a revolutionary and, and rather threatening po political position. It's a consensus among, among, among the contenders for power that, uh, that enables us to, to have democracy, but we should recognize, I want to argue, that politics comes first. So that, for example, I've argued that when Bremer in, in Iraq was trying to train a professional security force to accept the ideology that, 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 as, that, as, that a police and, and military officers should accept 
civilian democratic leadership at a time when there was no civilian democratic leadership because it was a foreign occupation force, uh, there was something impossible about that. Uh, a national government depends, I've argued, on, on broad acceptance of authority. I'd actually like to say, not, we tend, to, those of us who have national elections tend to think that power is built, depends on popular approval. I would like to argue that I think it depends more not on, on popular approval as in an a, a, a election to the, to the House of Commons or, or American presidential election, um, but, but in the sense that in any society, there are local leaders, and in particular in failed states, people are going to turn to the importance of local leaders in, in different communities is going to become greater. And it's really a, a broad acceptance of national authority by local leaders. But in the long run, local leadership depends on national recognition and support as well. So there's an interaction we have to recognize. In a democracy, we're hoping that we're going to get better, better public service by just as our manufacturers of, 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 of shoes and toothpaste should compete with each other to have for higher quality with low, less, lower profit margin. So in democracy, we're hoping to get better public service by we, the, the public, uh, getting to choose among competing political leaders. But, and I, as an economist, I respect, that I, I think that argument is absolutely true, but with some modification. In particular, I've argued technically, and I've had technical models to illustrate the point that people may support a corrupt incumbent if they think that all the alternatives would be worse. So it's not just about, successful democracy is not just about elections. True co democratic competition is going to depend on people thinking that there are other out-of-power leaders, candidates for high office, who might also, uh, who, who might do a good job of, of using public funds responsibly rather than just stealing them. Uh, now, in any competitive system, those who compete for power do not want it more competitive. Established leaders have an interest in high political entry barriers. Of course, dictatorship is, 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 is the, the ultimate then, forbidding anyone to compete for power le legally. But the, the, uh, when we find principles of competitive, of what makes com democracy more competitive, that which is going in a new in a new democracy is going to require trying somehow to increase the supply of individuals who have good reputations with their, in their society for using public funds to benefit the public. Uh, Anything that makes democracy more competitive may be distasteful for those who actually hope to be in power. Uh, so that's important to recognize. So, to develop a stronger democratic system, I'm arguing, the, goal, the essential goal must to be to develop a supply of potential democratic leaders who can compete meaningful in elections. And if I've got it in bold face here, I've said it before, I'll say it again because it, I want to argue the key political goal should be to increase the the key political goal for those who are benevolent, who, who truly wish a society well, would be to do things which will increase the national supply of leaders who have good reputations for spending public funds responsibly. I find in Paul Collier's work references to, to, uh, to, 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 to independent or auxiliary public service authorities, different low indigenous groups, who public service, excuse me, public service agencies, excuse me, uh, that, that, that provide public services. Uh, as being uh, uh, places where new reputations uh, that ultimately could be politically competitive become important and benefit a society. We're looking for w where those, rep in any society, uh, the contenders for power will need to have a reputation for providing patronage benefits to their loyal supporters. The question is, if you become leader with my support, will you also ask me not only, you'll give me a good cushy job in any case, a very nice well-paying job in any case, but will you give me a job where, where, where my, get, my, my handsome rewards will depend on my actually providing services for the broader population, or will you just let me take a share of the oil revenues uh, for having supported you? Uh, that's the question. Now, the distribution of, so I'm gonna argue that such reputations can be developed only with opportunities to spend public funds, and that such opportunities are multiplied most when some share of the public budget is devolved to autonomously elected local governments. So that is my central theme. I should note that in a parliamentary system, coalition governments also can distribute budgetary authority to political leaders who are effectively have an, an autonomous base of support uh, in, in separate parties. Uh, there's a word in favor of coalition governments. 
but devolution of power to provincial and, and municipal governments, I think is an important place where, where, where the building blocks of democracy have occurred in, in this country, in my country. Uh, I should recognize and I, 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 that, that, that the distribution of funds among different branches of government needs reliable accounting under a finance ministry. And in that sense, I, I want to recognize that I mentioned Ashraf Ghani and Claire Lockhart, whose book on uh, fixing failed states, I think is an important part of the literature to which I'm, I'm discussing. Ashraf Ghani was finance minister in Afghanistan uh, for a few years after 2002. Um, that when I talk about political decentralization, the dual cofactor that's, that's essential with it is the most centralized part of the government, the finance ministry, to the extent that the finance ministry can reliably uh, share funds between uh, the central government and, 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 and local municipal and provincial governments. I'll end with a picture of the uh, medieval court of the exchequer from Britain, from England, I should say. Uh, my point is going to be, is the core point is that lo allowing locally elected councils to have some autonomous authority can reduce entry barriers into national politics. Therefore, why? Because successful local leaders may be able to have opportunity to prove themselves as potential candidates, to build trust and prove their qualifications as candidates for higher office. Because it lowers entry barriers into national politics, there is a, there is a virtue uh, that we should recognize to, to political decentralization. But lowering entry barriers is not, is not appreciated by those who are on the other side of the barriers. So those who expect to be national leaders in the new regime may prefer centralization. And we may expect decentralization to be undersupplied. Of course, centralization also allows the president to take control uh, of, uh, of allocating uh, offices like mayors and governors, which uh, have enormous local power. And wherever there's power, uh, you, have, you have to pay them one way or another. Uh, they'll, or they'll take it themselves. That's what we call moral hazard rents. Uh, and loyal supporters if, if, may expect to be uh, appointed mayor or governor if, uh, if, that's a pot, if, if, that's, if, if that's what's been discussed in the past, a centralized regime. And the, that power, obviously, is something that a national leader would like to be able to promise uh, to his supporters. Uh, of course, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, the effectiveness of local government can suffer when the positions of local authority become rewards of national patronage, uh, a national patronage system that's based in the capital. Uh, local councils, local elected po politicians, have more information, and local councils can use more information in supervising police and other uh, local public service agencies. I sh should say I, I take from uh, Seth Jones's book on, on, on Afghanistan, written a few years ago, um, that from the perspective as he laid it out, uh, the number one, the core problem in, uh, in, 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 in ISAF policies of the years after 2002 may have been the decision to have, to, to, to have only centralized policing, to have all police in Afghanistan be under a chain of command that goes to the, up to the presidential palace in Kabul rather than uh, reporting to, uh, to, to locally elected councils. Um, and the resistance to local security forces is, is of course, been a deep question. But, but um, let's see which side I'm taking on that. I've argued that local democracy can make national politics more competitive as successful local leaders can prove their qualifications to compete for higher office. I need to recognize also that competitive multi-party national politics can make local politics more competitive as rival national parties can sponsor competition to unpopular local bosses. I come from Chicago, which has long been a one-party uh, city-state, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but the mayor of Chicago, if, uh, if unpopular, uh, could not uh, prevent a, uh, a, the Republican Party from, uh, from nominating a, 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 a real challenger. So I'm going to argue, if we're going to talk about democratic state building, we need to understand the roots of democracy, and I would argue that effective democracy depends on interactions between local and national politics, and I think that's a Madisonian point. And that's where I come to, this, to, to a core point, which I'm going to argue, which I'm arguing that democratic political reconstruction should be based on two primary political pillars, 
a multi-party national assembly, and elected local councils. Um, the, the core problem, so let me get to my charter. Uh, the core problem is, I think the title here says, we need to mitigate interfere, intervener's interference, I'm sorry, mitigate interfere in the intervener's influence in installing national leaders. Here I am standing up and saying that, that, that the powers who invade my country, I want them to not to establish local councils after they invade, uh, to not just set up a, a national leadership, uh, and to devolve substantial powers to local. Well, are they then, they've, they've invaded the United States to get rid of our dysfunctional political system and to help us to have a better country. They say, no, they're going to, and I say, no, you, you can establish a provisional government but uh, at the national level, but you should also uh, allow us to have uh, local politics and, and have some relationship between those. Um, are they, the inter an intervention should not be an externally imposed partition of a nation. Any nation sh should resist foreigners who want to, whose real motive is to, is to reduce the, the power of the people in that region to partition it. So what, what it, we have to be careful about advocating a principle of devolution of power. A national government must be constituted by these allegedly benevolent uh, state building interveners. And it's difficult to get together, uh, get a bunch of politicians to all agree on, on a sharing of power in a way that can provide an effective provisional national government. So the far, foreign interveners are going to need to, to supervise the initial selection of a cabinet. And if they've taken military control of our country, we're going to have to recognize that they're going to have to have a voice in, uh, in, in, in choosing the initial leadership of the country. We want, the goal of the standards is to make sure that their th fingerprint, their thumbprint on our uh, national leadership is as reversible as possible. That, 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 and we have to recognize in a parliamentary system, uh, as you have in your country, and here in, in Britain, but I don't have in America, a parliamentary system allows any given leader to be replaced by a, a broader assembly. So the, it's not hard for, to, to invite in a broad multinational United Nations and other countries to, to, to participate in recruiting a, a national assembly for a country in a way that makes sure that a wide variety of, 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 of observers agree that, that different important force, forces in the nation are represented in this assembly. Now the cabinet has to work together, so it's not so easy to, to have a broadly representative cabinet, but a principle of, of parliamentary oversight with uh, parliamentary responsibility with constructive no confidence could say, ah, if this broadly representative assembly can form a majority in favor of some other cabinet, fine, they can replace them any time. So, so parliamentary principle has, has a good place, should have a good place in our standards for state builders. I want, I've argued the goal, the, the new leadership needs to be given an opportunity. Whoever takes power at the top at first is going to have an opportunity to show the people what they can do. But look, if, if there's a devolution of, of some share of the public budget to local councils that they're locally elected, uh, that's a good thing. So let's say that, that sh as soon as possible after, the, after the, 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 the pacification of the country, there should be local elections. I should say, I think, there's been much controversy about what was the greatest mistake made by the, 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 the coalition forces under Paul Bremer's leadership in the early months of, uh, in the months of April and May in 2003 in, in Iraq. And people have talked about the demathification order and the dissolution of the army. I would put number three, as the, as the, as, to me, even more important than those, was the decision by Paul Bremer to, to disallow any local elections. Local, local mil army commanders, and, uh, British and American commanders, were spontaneously uh, uh, asking uh, people to, to organize imperfect but, but elections for local councils, and Paul Bremer said, no, you can't do any of that. I think that was just the wrong answer, that, that as, soon as, as soon as this National Assembly comes together at least, uh, they should be invited to form different factions, and those factions should participate in supervising local elections as soon as possible. And as soon as there have been local elections, I'm going to suggest the representation from those local councils should, should join the, or maybe reconstitute the National Assembly. So a national assembly that, uh, that is, 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 uh, has representation from these local councils can make sure that there's going to be a working relationship between our, our per interim government and, our, and at the national level and at the local level. In an established federal system, a reputation for working with local leaders within an accepted division of powers becomes essential 
for building a national coalition because when there are independently elected mayors and governors, um, they become really important. They are the, some of the most important uh, local political leaders and anybody who wants to run for high office had better not be threatening to, to take away all the power of, of, of these locally elected leaders. Uh, in a system that is not is fully centralized, of course, the, 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 the prizes of appointing mayors and governors becomes one of the most important patronage prizes a national leader can offer. So federal decentral, centralization and decentralization either can be stable. Uh, interveners can help to establish a durable system, a durable federal system, by encouraging nas the national leaders who they appoint to develop such reputations for working with local elected councils, which would, under this. So here's my chart. Yeah, there it is. It, uh, I promised to say it, and, and, and uh, I've got the floor for a few more minutes, so, 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 but, but I hope afterwards there will be discussion and attack and whatever, but I, I, I'll put a thesis forward. So the first principle was with the broadest possible multinational supervision, inviting in the United Nations and regional organizations and whoever else, the intervening powers should sponsor a broadly representative interim national assembly. Point, point two, the national executive ministers, the first ones can be appointed by the, uh, by the intervening powers, yes, but thereafter, they, they should be responsible to, the, to this assembly in a parliamentary system with constructive no-confidence votes. Three, with participation of, the par of parties that are represented in this interim assembly, local elections should be held as soon as possible to choose local councils and districts throughout the nation. Four, once these local councils are in place, uh, the transitional national assembly should be reconstituted to include representatives from these local councils so that we can now share power between these two these two levels. Five, the funds, which are maybe at first going to come from the foreign interveners and, and foreign donors, uh, must be allocated transparently to the, both to the local councils and the national executive in some balance, maybe two-thirds to the national executive, one-third to the local councils, or 20% to the municipal governments, 20% to the provincial governments, and 60%, I don't know, but some formula. Foreign donors must work with the National Finance Ministry to give the people of the country a full accounting of the funds that have been spent at all levels of government. And six, this is a novel, this has nothing to do with anything I've said before, except, but, but, but damn it, here's a good idea. Um, if you're going to have, there's going to be a commission to draft a permanent constitution which may look nothing like this, but, in, but if one has the provision that a minority of one-third or more should be able to report an alternative draft for the national ratification. So the, the one, in, I, I'm not aware of any country which has established democratic rule in which the establishment of the Constitution itself has been a competitive election, but there's no reason why not. And the threat that, uh, that, that what, typically what happens in constitutional conventions is somebody, maybe it's George Washington or James Madison, controls the, 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 doc, the document and uh, people kind of have to negotiate to, to get the document uh, changed or else we just don't have an agreement. Um, but the idea that, that, uh, that a there could be a minority report is, is, my, is, 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 is something I want to put forward. So there, let me say, that's a, there it is. There's a cookie cutter, one size fits all prescription, obviously, uh, and it's put forward by a theorist. And yet, these, this is my attempt to make a, ch a charter must be that. And, uh, and, and I, I hope it's, I, I want to put it forward because I think it's something worth considering. I've done the best job I could. And uh, if I haven't done, done it right, I, I'd like to provoke discussion. Um, there's a paper on this, and you can criticize it and write your own paper. Good. Uh, let me say a few more things. One is, is that decentralization, I want to argue, can materially reduce the cost of, of, of state building. Um, I want to argue this is not just, uh, I've tried to argue standards from some kind of moral view, and, and I've tried to put it, if we are imagining that we are the people whose, whose country has, has either been a failed state or, or had an a, 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 a internationally unacceptable dictator or ruler overthrown by foreign forces, what, principle, what general principles would we like those interveners to apply in, in, as they are occupying our country? But um, in theory, a benevolent invasion should be more, should be easier than, a, than an invasion to conquer and, 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 and exploit the people of a country because it should be resisted less. Uh, a recent experience doesn't seem to confirm that. I want to say something about that, but I want to argue that decentralization might actually help. Uh, 
therefore centralization, I think the excessive centralization that, that I've, I, I, I've criticized, for example, in, 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 Iraq, in the government of Iraq, may be in the interest of the national leaders. It's easy to understand how the president, the, the president of, 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 of the Republic of Iraq uh, might like having total centralization of power, but I would argue it's not been in the interveners, that our, our, our forces who have, 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 have fought to sustain it would have had had to, to, to take fewer risks and, 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 and with less, less uh, a loss of life and less expenditure of our military budget uh, if, if, the, if the regime we were sustaining was more decentralized. State building can be compared to, archi it's, a, it's an architectural analogy and anybody would understand that the cost of building a house depends on the architectural plan of the house and so the, it should, the cost of, of, of a state building intervention should depend on the constitutional architecture of the, of the, uh, of the, of the state that we are, we are trying to build or sustain. I want to argue specifically, this, for example, that the success of the Sunni awakening in Anbar province in Iraq after 2006 depended essentially on the federal structure of Iraq's constitutions. The awakening leaders were, were Sunni, were uh, I believe rural sh uh, sheikhs, uh, rural tribal leaders, and they anticipated that cooperation with Americans would position them well for elections, provincial elections, which were promised and which were held only, they were promised in 2008, they were actually held in 2009, and I believe American diplomats had to work hard to make sure that the Iraqi national government actually held those elections. I would argue that promises from, from, the, from the, the, the American forces in Anbar province could not have given the Sunni sheikhs any real reason to risk their lives in defending a political system that had no place for them. And imagine how different that society, their position would have been if Iraq in 2006 had had a centralized presidential regime like that of Afghanistan today rather than the federal constitution that promised provincial elections which in fact was in place in Iraq then. Intervention forces, I believe, I understand that intervention forces in Afghanistan, people can tell me if I'm wrong, have found many districts where virtually no one feels any particular political stake in, in defending the, 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 the centralized political regime that has been our, our coalition forces mission to defend. I think it's, if you look at uh, my reading of the history is, is that, for example, uh, without saying that every local mullah is a supporter of the Taliban, it's easy for a local mullah in a, in a, in a small town of, in, in Afghanistan to, to believe that if the Taliban take over, uh, he will have a, a, an important place, and that makes it easier for him to have some confidence. Uh, I read in Carter Malkasian's book on War Comes to Garmsar in Helmand Province. He, in the middle of the book, describes at some point a successful counterinsurgency strategy. You get control, of, you're patrolling the streets, and the key to his, his, to his strategy is you then start offering money and control of local security forces to selected local leaders. You say to selected local leaders, if you play ball with us, if you work with us, you'll have a budget to provide some local public goods that, that you, you and your supporters like, and we'll, some of you will, will, will be authorized to carry around weapons and, and help with, with maintaining security. But the Constitution of Afghanistan provides no pro autonomous protection for, for any local authorities, and in the, in the story as I read it, regularly his, 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 success and his local successes be, become undermined when there's an intervention from the, from the capital and the president dismisses some of these local leaders and appoints someone else who has political connections in the capital but, but is, has, has not been supporting. I, at the bottom of the screen I quote a, a famous and very important quote from David Galula, the author of the, 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 the old uh, classic of counterinsurgency uh, warfare from 1964 where he says ultimately the essence of the whole thing in counterinsurgency is to build a political machine from the population upward and what that means if it doesn't mean, if it isn't calling for some decentralization of authority some reliance on local politics I'm not, I don't know that's that that seems to me to be implicitly talking about uh, a, a system of, of national and local authorities um, let me say Non-democratic decentralization has been a, a, an, an, an imperial state building. We should recognize uh, that, that, that the thing about the, the you know, speaking in Oxford, I have to talk about the tradition of the British Empire, which astonishing that, 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 that a small number of, 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 of 
uh, administrators and, and, and soldiers from this country could go halfway around the world and establish the, the British Empire in India. The, uh, there's a, an excellent paper, do I have the review? Yes, by Abhijit Banerjee and, and Lakshmi Iyer in uh, um, uh, the American Economic Review in 2005 that com studies the, the, the quad, the, about 25% of India is in regions where the Brit British Empire granted local power and privileges to feudal agents called zamindars. Uh, so the, the, British, the, the British agents could go in and say, pick, pick a local leader. If, if, the, if the, the, the natural local leader didn't go along, you could go to, the, to, to an obvious contender and offer him the opportunity to become the zamindar. Uh, the, the British Empire ref respected these as permanent property rights. They then were responsible for collecting taxes and maintaining order in their community and they then had a vested interest in, in depending the regime. This is feudalism, of course. Uh, 50 years after independence, who's it? Oh, it's just the 19th century reformers like, like James John Stuart Mill, Bentham, uh, criticized the, the, this, this feudal system because there, there were large rents being taken by these feudal zamindars. Uh, they were costly political expense for the empire, and, and Britain uh, stopped using them in, in areas that came under British rule, I think, after about 1825. But then after the 1857 mutiny, when, 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 when the, suddenly the regime seemed more, more, less, less sure, uh, the zamindar system was reinstituted for areas that came under direct British rule in that period. Uh, and, and long after independence, Banerjee and Iyer could still find lower agricultural productivity and si statistically significantly higher infant mortality in areas that had had zamindar governance. The point is that feudalism may be, is, is a non-democratic form of decentralization, and it is a very effective way to build a state. Uh, it may have long-term economic consequences because it's non-democratic, uh, for sure. Uh, in the, I would argue, I pose the question of why, would, why were the Americans, why did it take America only, in only about two years, less than two years, to pacify the Philippines against a, 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 an insurgency against, against uh, uh, that was, in, Every, everything was, militarily, everything was different in, in 1900 compared to, to 2003, for example, but uh, I think the, 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 it's hard to argue that the balance of forces between uh, American invaders and, and indigenous uh, opponents uh, was different in the Philippines from Iraq, uh, and certainly not, uh, not adverse in, Af and certainly um, not better than in Afghanistan, where there was broad sympathy, I think, for our entry. Uh, but in the Philippines, because we were setting, the Americans were setting up a colonial government, American commanders felt free to offer local power to uh, collaborating local leaders. They could go into a town and look at the local big shots and say, if you cooperate with us, uh, we'll just let you take over, you'll, we'll let you run the, the local government here. Uh, there was no central indigenous authority and no indigenous president in Manila who they, they had to defer to, and that, that that didn't pacify every place, but that certainly enabled rapid pacification of most of the Philippines by a, a, uh, a counterinsurgency force. So my argument is that feudalism can help to establish a, pol a stable political regime, but it can have serious long-term costs. And I've asked how much of global underdevelopment has resulted from such feudal, uh, colonial and traditional state building. But let me finally, and I have to say, uh, I want to talk about the British, the, in brief, about decentralization here in, in England and, and in America. Um, that uh, the, if you go back, and, and I, 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 I come to you as a student of, of medieval uh, English political history, and anybody who goes back and reads the standard uh, uh, sources on, 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 uh, on the period after, after uh, from uh, certainly from Henry II uh, onwards, uh, the primary political institution in, uh, in, 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 the, in the growth of medieval English government was the, the Court of the Exchequer. What is the Court of the Exchequer? The answer is, of course, now it's the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is, is, is the finance minister of this country, and you know that the, it's about accounting and, and, uh, uh, and about money, uh, but um, the Court of the Exchequer was a, was a court to regulate, to provide public accounting of transactions between the national and provincial governments, between the sheriffs who were the governors of the, of the counties or provinces of this country and the central government, the treasurer. Uh, 
the next great institutional development in, 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 in England, I would argue, of the parliament, was a national forum to guarantee that it, it wasn't, of course, in 1300 under Edward I, the parliament was not set up as, as the people of England sending the representatives. It was the representatives of the, of the, of the rural gentry and the town oligarchies. Uh, that is to say, it was the, rep the people who were responsible for local government in, in the counties and towns of this country were, were get, sending representatives for, to, to a national forum in which they could then complain about uh, abuse of power by higher in levels of government. So it was, it was a forum for regulating the, uh, the, the interactions between local go municipal governments, local county governments, uh, town, town governments, and, and, and the national government. Um, I didn't know I was going to be speaking under a magnificent portrait of King George III. Um, let me at least note that American colonial governments uh, came to, to include locally elected legislatures. They didn't, it wasn't the first thing on people's mind when they settled Virginia in 1607, but they rapidly set up uh, local uh, provincial assemblies in, in each of the 13 colonies that became my country, one to encourage English settlers to come to America and guarantee that they would be enfranchised and have, you know, and have, have but also, and, and in the long run, more importantly, to offer loyal service in local militias, which uh, the, 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 the assemblies, uh, the, the power of the assemblies was essential to maintaining the loyalty of the local militias, uh, which ultimately were the, mach the, the military machine that enabled the, the, the colonists to push back the, the, the Native Americans who were there first. Uh, the, I'm sorry, sir, but the Declaration of Independence, of course, was a claim of sovereignty by 13 provincial assemblies. There, were, there are some perfunctory um, words about human rights, but, but what's really serious is a complaint of, 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 provincial, of the provincial legislators. Um, the first transitional government of the United States was characterized by decentralization and parliamentary, parliamentary responsibility. This is the Articles of Confederation which existed from 1776 to 1788. Uh, I want to argue, and this, I'm not, sorry, sir, this, is a, this may be a painful point to raise here, but um, I think the, uh, the success of the American Revolution politically depend, there's, if you read American history of the Revolution, there's a lot of complaints about the decentralization, the political decentralization meant that it was extremely difficult for George Washington to get money to, for his soldiers, and they had a bad winter or two in Valley Forge, for example, because the, the, uh, the people didn't want to pay taxes to, their, to, the, to, the, to separate provinces or states, and the states didn't want to share money with the national government for the Continental Army that they were putting together. Uh, but there was an advantage to the decentralization. In particular, every community had at least one local big shot, its representative in the provincial assembly, who had a personal vested interest in defending the new regime. And I believe that's ultimately why any place where the British Army was not holding in force, they couldn't prevent from returning to, to, to uh, revolutionary uh, control. Certainly, the establishment of competitive national democracy after 1789 depended on the supply of candidates with proven records of public service in the 13 provinces. So as I'm at the end of my time, let me conclude by saying that for all its faults, I want to say here under, this, under the shadow of, of, of under the, the portrait of, of George III, that America's Articles of Confederation should be recognized as a good example of a transitional regime for democratic state building. I don't think American diplomats uh, who've gone out on such missions have been thinking about it that way, but that in, in a nutshell, in one sentence, is the best I can do and I promise to end with uh, a picture of the Court of the Exchequer and, uh, and, and a quote from uh, Richard Fitznagel's uh, uh, explanation of that it was really of why in the Exchequer the core is relationship between the provincial governors and the, the central government. Thank you.